Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Time Out with Tackle What's Next, where we speak with athletes and executives about how sport has made an impact on their lives and the lessons they've learned in life outside of the game. I'm your host, Danielle Berman. I am the founder and CEO of Tackle What's Next, where we help athletes create an impact outside of sports and find their purpose in life after the game. And thanks for being here and taking a time out with us uh, at Tackle What's Next. Tonight, we are talking to Tolly Bellavacqua. Tolly is a retired WNBA champion, played for 14 seasons. She's an Olympic gold medalist for the Australian basketball team and a FIBA world champion. Since retiring, she has been involved with a lot of different initiatives. She's launched a gym with her partner that she ran for a long time. She's done some personal training. Now she has reconnected to her basketball roots, and she works as a commentator for uh, the women's game, calling shots for the fever, among others. She's been doing some stuff during March Madness this week. So we are so, so thrilled to have Tolly here. She is also speaking tomorrow at our Tackle What's Next Summit on athlete identity and mental health. We really appreciate her being so involved this week and uh, pulling double duty for us here at Tackle What's Next, but she's fantastic. We're so excited to have her. Um, Again, if you're interested in learning more about our summit, uh, you can go to our website, tacklewhatsnext.com, and register. We've got some great sessions tomorrow and Friday uh, for you guys to check out. Uh, as we bring Tolly on screen, of course, we're so excited to talk to her about her story, about what she's doing uh, in life after sports. Uh, and please feel free to share this link out with your friends afterwards. Uh, we are really excited to have her here with us. So I am going to get her here on screen in just a moment, and we will get started. I see we've got some people people in here t- tuning in. So thank you for being here. Um, we're just going to give her another minute to get going and uh, we'll be ready to rock and roll. So thank you guys for uh, being here and for checking out Time Out with Tackle What's Next. Here she is. Hey, how's it, <laughs> how's it going? It's going. It's going good. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out with us tonight. I'm so excited to have you and uh, we're excited to chat more about you know, what you're doing now in life after sports. Well, I was actually a little worried um, because yesterday I had my second shot and not knowing how the body was going to react to that, I was uh, crossing everything to make sure I was hoping (laughs) that it was just a sore arm. So thankfully, because I know some other people, some who are actually watching right now, had, um, you know, the chills and the fevers and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm glad that there was nothing to worry about. And I'm glad you got your second shot. Hopefully uh, that's step back to normal here. Um, and and yeah. speaking of that, you know, what have you been up to the last couple of years? Obviously the last year has been just a whirlwind for everybody. Uh, but what have you, been, have you been staying busy? Did you have to change gears? Tell us about what the last uh, year has been like for you. Uh, well, I'm a people person. So it has kind of been really hard. Um, so I, we had the kids at home doing virtual. And can you hear me well? Perfect. Yeah, Perfect. Good. All right. Um, so we had the kids at home doing virtual school. And at the beginning, I started out as a, a grade A teacher. Um, and I'm very embarrassed to admit that by, and I mean, they had been doing this for a full year. Um, and so by the time we were able to send them back to school. I had slipped down to like a C, C minus <laughs> kind of a teacher um, because it really did start to get me down. It started to affect the kids. Their mm-hmm. focus. Um, so it was a little bit of a challenge there, but I mean, we were fortunate that we didn't have, have to um, change too much um, in terms of our lives. You know, um, because he had a full-time job still. So we we're financially, you know, all pretty sound to to make it happen. And uh, we had the means, obviously, um, internet access and computers and that to to let it run as smoothly as possible. Definitely. Yeah, I think it's it's funny that you said that. I feel like a lot of parents right now have just been like, oh, my God, (laughs) why, why, why? So it's, it's been a lot. It's been a lot to manage. And, you know, even with just two people here, it's a lot of time in the same room with the same people all the time. And, you know, I'm sure with kids, you guess probably some nights are just like, okay, it's time for me to go. go, (laughs) To go through just as many clothes and dishes. And it was just a nightmare constantly. But, you know, we got through it. We managed. Yeah. It's all good. We're fine. Yeah. The light, there, there is a light now, kind of, we can start to feel there is a light at the end of the tunnel. So, but, you know, still mask up everybody. Do the yes. right. 
Definitely, definitely. Well, I'm glad to hear that, you know, now hopefully you, you don't have to be a teacher if you don't want to be anymore and you can move on. So <laughs> not, of, not of education like that. No. Yeah. <laughs> I'll teach you some basketball moves and things like that, but oh my gosh, please don't come at me with um, fractions and uh, oh. <laughs> Yeah. Me neither. Me neither. That that would not be me. So definitely glad to hear that. And I want to talk about too your you know back in your first sports experiences. Oh please, cheers! I, I love it. <laughs> but you know, tell us a little bit about what your sports sports experiences were like. How did you choose basketball? Tell us about those early days. Well, I grew up in a very small country town. Um, I come from Western Australia, state of Western Australia. Um, so the small country town I grew up in was about three hours inland from Perth, which is the capital city of Western Australia, and population of about 5,000 max. So sports were seasonal. Um, everything, mostly everything was outdoors. Um, and so I just, I had two older brothers and I just pretty much at the age of five from the earliest of my memories, um, just kind of followed them around and did whatever they did. And so obviously, like in Australia, we have a few different sports. So I was doing Aussie rules football, cricket, netball, um, and your usual tennis, soccer, I mean, badminton. I mean, I, I was very fortunate that I could um, pick up something and, and do it reasonably well. But it was, I guess it was like at the age of um, 15, where it was like, well, maybe I need to choose which one that I, I thought, not necessarily the one I was best at, because um, otherwise some of my other family members might have picked a different sport. Um, but basketball was the one that I was most passionate about and being around teammates and just the game itself was the one mm -hmm. that really hit home, kind of grabbed my heart. And so it was around the age of 15 when I received a scholarship, a country scholarship um, for a few thousand dollars to help offset you know, the cost of travel and everything uh, for my parents um, that I was like, well, let's, you know, focus on the basketball and see where it goes. Yeah, definitely. I think it's um, really funny to hear so many people started out playing so many different sports, right? So many athletes we talked to are like, oh, I played all these sports and I love them. Body. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's it's always funny to hear, you know, the reasons why. And, and usually it's the sport that's just like, I couldn't live without this sport. If I had to choose one, this is the one that I couldn't, you know, go every day without being involved in. So... Yeah, I can live yeah. that. I mean, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. Well, and cool. what was that experience like coming into the professional space, playing on the world championship stage, competing in the Olympics, competing? In, like, what has that experience been like in the WNBA? Like, what? Tell us a little bit about that. You know, it, it still seems a little surreal, but it, it's, you know, it's kind of funny because when I refer to talking about playing against other players, you know, I. I kind of don't see myself in the same regard because I'm like, oh my god, I played against I'm playing against the best players in the world. You know, Miss Bird, so let's see, and your Dutch Russies and Tamika Catchings and obviously all the other countries as well. Um, and it's weird because I'm not thinking of the fact that I'm in that very small percentage of people that are in that top, um, you know, level. And so it's let me just take a moment to reflect on that. No, <laughs> just joking. Um, so it's kind of surreal a little bit still, but I mean, the most amazing experiences um, with the national team, obviously winning the world championships for the very first time for any, you know, Australian uh, senior team, mm -hmm. or women, um, that was very special. And then obviously to get to the Olympics and my own Olympics in um, 2008, um, at a very sprightly age of, I don't know, 30 or whatever was, was pretty amazing too. So, and to have my parents, in the yeah. stand um, in Beijing was was just kind of like put the icing on the cake. Hopefully they saw the rewards, you know, come to fruition and all the blood, sweat and tears that were poured into my career and allow me to do everything that I could to get there. It was, um, it was nice to have them in the stands and a few tears were shed, you know, the very first game where you could hear the national anthem being played and, mm -hmm. you know, you could feel the hairs on the back of your neck you know, stick up and yeah. So lots of great memories and, you know, just little things along the way, little like stories of things that wouldn't normally happen if I wasn't representing Australia. Um, right. So I was actually talking to Lauren Jackson this morning, which made me remember this kind of story. So we also compete, Australia also competes in the Commonwealth Games. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in 2006, uh, it was in Melbourne and we were in the village and uh, there was a group of us just going for a walk down one of the strips of the 
um, of the uh, the players, you know, retreat. And one of our former prime ministers was on the other side of the road, just with his little entourage walking. And Australians are pretty laid back. I don't know if you've come across many or whatever, <laughs> but pretty laid back. And so Loz, you know, sticks out like a sore tooth. You know, she starts waving her arm around and she's like, because the, the former prime minister's name is John Howard. And she's like, Johnny boy. Hey, Johnny boy. Well, he whips his head around, sees us, and comes trotting on over. And Oh, my gosh. Uh, I mean, we're huggers as well. So he's, like, hugging us all, and we take a few happy snaps, and then he just goes on his merry way. I mean, little things like that. that yeah. We weren't a part of that, you know, little community of um, athletes. Yeah, I love that. It's, it is so true. You, you mentioned earlier, like, how you don't sometimes realize it until you've left that position of, like, wow, mm -hmm. I was playing – at the same level, like you think about those those names you mentioned, and then you're like, "Well, I was part of that. Like that was that was me too. Yeah. Now <laughs> I'm one of those names, right? Participated yeah. in uh, final fours, and uh, it's, it's you know you just your chest just bursts with being so proud of uh, mm -hmm. their achievements. Yeah, I I think that's a great story. I love it, and and it it does make it you know kind of tie into my next question, which is how has your basketball experience translated into your life and who you are today what has all those little experiences and those big ones kind yeah. of created for you well I you know I, I I hope and I feel like it is true I feel like it's really made me humble um just in terms of really not taking for granted everything that has come my way um mm -hmm. And just being able to go to all the countries that I have visited through basketball, and some were, you know, your war-torn countries over in Europe, um, and, you know, being able to kind of communicate with um, some of the family members of my teammates over in Europe who couldn't speak English, but still being able to communicate in different ways um, mm -hmm. other than verbally, uh, and just having the best time and um, just being embraced by them, um, it, you know, it's taught me how to be adaptable in life. Um, I mean, you go from team to team to team. And so yeah. you're dealing with different personalities as teammates. Um, you're dealing with different coaches who have different techniques. Um, and obviously you're de dealing with different lifestyles, uh, whether, you know, obviously in Europe or um, America is not so much different to Australia. Um, so that's, that wasn't too bad. But, you know, when you go to Europe, it's adapting to different lifestyles there and, and kind right. of trying to blend in with with their community, which they appreciate so much as well, and learning mm -hmm. some of the language, um, if depending on how, you know, well um, everyone can, you know, speak the same language or you may have to learn how to speak their language just to, you know, fit in. So being adaptable, um, just the communication, obviously, so important with everything yeah. um and just yeah just being a you know work as a team work with different team members um and getting things done and handling with adversities that come al along the way with it obviously as an athlete you know you're dealing with injuries you're dealing with being cut by teams um so it's just showing the character of how you come back from those situations i think shows some of your, your true strength as well yeah, no, I think that's a great point. I think you guys um, that have played sports at a high level or even, you know, at a youth level, you learn that lesson of failure and bouncing back, um, you know, really, really well, <laughs> probably more well adjusted to that experience. Yeah, breaking, um, you know, being cut yep. the time for, you know, is, is heartbreaking. Um, obviously, injuries are heartbreaking. So yep. it, it's not easy to yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's, I think, too, you kind of talked about that, some of the skills that you've learned also, but, but what, you know, what are you using today in some of the work you're doing, right? I know you're commentating, and I know you're doing a little real estate dabbling here and there, too. Like, what are, what are some of the things that you're, like, some of these big lessons that sport taught you that you're using every day as you do some of this work? Well, um, I mean, pretty much that kind of, like, I guess, tied in, um, obviously, with the the basketball side of things, um, just, you know, that communication is, is so important. Now, obviously, I'm doing it in a way where I'm talking to the audience instead. Um, mm -hmm. But also trying to tell my own story within that, having played with some of the players still that are out there and yeah. um, just kind of like trying to give it a perspective from a former player, uh, from, you know, from my point of view. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's where I'm coming from with 
with that. Um, you know, I used to dabble with a little bit of real estate even way before coming over to the WNBA. Um, it was my first my first job outside of um, high school. So I'm kind of like coming back to that. And I love it. It's pe just the people skills. You know, sometimes it doesn't matter if you know a little more or a little less than somebody else. Um, it's the people skills that can really seal the deal at the end of the day. So just understanding how to read the room. Um, I think that's extremely important, um, knowing your audience um, and just getting to know a little bit about the person or the people that you're dealing with um, and making a personal connection with them, uh, I think goes a long way. Yeah, no, and, and I see Kelsey just commented, Kelsey Drain in the comments, the best personality, which I agree. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you, you have this, <laughs> the people skills you have are so important and it's, it is those, you know, not those kind of technical skills, right? It's not like, oh, can you use this software? Can you do this? You can learn that, right? That you can develop yeah. that skill. But yeah. like you said, it's like the leadership, the, the communication, learning how to, you know, be coached, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's all about um, making bridges, not burning bridges. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a player, you're going to come across so many people, so many contacts that you can make connection with with that you don't know down the track if you will cross paths again and they might be able to help you with something or introduce you to other people or yeah. actually offer you something themselves. Um, and that's one of the things, uh, you know, I like to preach a lot about is get to know if you're it, talking about a team environment, get to know who your sponsors are. Uh, yeah. Go and make your own connections if it's not done through the, the team um media relations person you know handing out appearances and things like that be proactive yourself and go out and seek and meet the right people and you know sometimes you know as i said down the track um might come into you know into play once you're kind of like talking about beyond basketball or beyond yeah. sport or whatever it is yeah definitely i think that's really good advice and you never know what's going to happen, right? You might meet someone and say, oh, that's interesting. I've never thought about that two years down the road. Well, <laughs> I needed that contact, right? And, yeah, and, and just general conversation too. Like, what's yeah. what do you like to do outside of here? You know, what exactly. You, they're just, it's just normal conversation with somebody. Yeah, it's building that relationship, right? It's not necessarily like looking at it like, oh my gosh, like I need to know this person because <laughs> I want to use them for something one day, right? It's like, oh no, it's I want to get to know this person. Mm -hmm because down the road, we might be able to do something together, or they might be in a position where I could learn from them, right? So I think it's, it's to your point, building those bridges and building yep. those relationships with the people you're around. Like as an athlete, you're around so many different people that if you start to build those relationships, you have this fantastic contact list of people that whatever you decide to get into, you've got a team of people that are like rooting for you. I mean, I'm just looking and clearly you've done this because I'm looking in the comments <laughs> as we're talking and people are cheering you on and they're like, I, we love Tommy, she's the best. So. <laughs> going and not, yeah, smile at the same time. Yeah. Um, you know, and first impressions are extremely important. So, you know, just think about when you're going to do, and, and you know, as a player, you know, you, sometimes you don't want to go and do appearances or, yeah. or you know, you've had a, shitty practice or and you're not in the good my apologies um if you're not in a good frame of mind yeah. um, and you've got to go make an appearance with you know a sponsor's company or whatever uh you have to be able to you know put your game face on and and shut that out put your game face on and you know say fake your way through it um because first impressions are extremely important Definitely, definitely. And you talked a little bit about um, the advice you'd have, but what for athletes, but what what have you done um, in your transition? So you've you've left sport. Now you're still working in the sports industry. But what did you do? Or maybe what did you wish you would have done um, as you were starting to well, leave yeah. basketball? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God, hindsight's a great thing, isn't it? Yeah, um, for sure. Okay, so I'll take it back a little bit just before the retirement kind of part. So as I said, Australians pretty laid back. Sometimes that can work against you as well because, you know, we have this she'll be right mentality, you know, deal with that when it, when it comes and yeah. when it happens. Well, she came at me pretty quick. And so it was like, what am I going to do now? But um, so in 2010, uh, I was with the Indiana Fever. And so in my head, it was like, oh, well, I'll just play out one more year with them um thinking that it was just going to be an automatic contract renewal 
And in that year, I will then prepare for that next step, which is not the right thing to do as well. For players now coming into the league, not the right thing to do. <laughs> prepare for retirement when you start your career. Um, so that's the most important thing is prepare for retirement at the very start. Um, because unfortunately, the harsh reality is you're only maybe one injury away from a career ending um, situation. So um, anyway, so that's that. So 2010, just anticipated we'd roll over one more year. Well, that didn't get offered. And so it was like this big dose of reality just hit me in the face. Yeah. Like, what am I going to do now? I just anticipated this was going to go this way. Like I was, I'd been very fortunate. Things had rolled in my favor up until that point. So thankfully my agent was able to um, get a two year deal with San Antonio. So one more than what I was expecting two years. Great. But it wasn't guaranteed. Mm. So that kind of put me back into a, a, a space of what I felt or feelings of what I felt when I was first coming into the league where it was like every day you had to perform because, you know, one bad day um, could result in you being told, well, thank you, but, you know, we don't need your services anymore. Um, right. So, you know, I went into San Antonio and normally by the at the stage of my career with a lot of, um, you know, veteran players, you get a bit of time off during training camp, obviously, it's smart, rest your body as you want them to play. But my situation was different because I'm having to compete against all these young whippersnappers coming into the league. And if I take a day off, yeah. um, they have a sensational practice, you know, how's that then going to affect me? Because they're visually being seen. I'm sitting on the sidelines taking a day off because mm -hmm. I'm older and stuff. Like it, it really, it changed my whole mentality. And so I probably, um, I really tore my body up in those two years to get through because I didn't take practices off for those reasons to, you know, make sure I solidified my spot because, you know, at the end of the day, I wanted to set a, uh, like a foundation going into um, retirement and those two years of that income was a big part of the plan um, in, you know, that transition. Yeah. So there was a lot of ice baths. There was a lot of um, ibuprofen being taken, you know, don't, recommend it but you know I, that's what I had to do to, to get through that and so in the final year of San Antonio um, we decided to start up a, a boot camp facility we'd done our homework because the boot camps weren't the biggest thing back then mm -hmm. um, and so we did a lot of research in terms of where our location was going to be and how many other boot camp facilities and all that fun stuff and the demographics and so we, um, in that last year of San Antonio, we uh, leased a, a premise site unseen, but by a good friend. Another thing I don't recommend, but you have to have a good friend that you trust a lot to do that. But it, in the situation yeah. I was in, it was kind of like one of the only choices because I was not in Indiana. So we rented out a, a lease out a facility for a year that when I stopped playing, I literally stepped off the plane and stepped straight into um, our Gym 41 was what the gym was called and started running boot camps because um, in my time off during the season, I would come back and um, we would do a lot of uh, shopping around on Craigslist and stuff for equipment and that to stock up the gym with to start the boot camp facility. So um, it was a process to get to. And obviously in that last year, I also did um, personal training course to get my license um, and kind of learn the tricks of the trade from the business side of things. Yeah. Um, and then it was another reality hit because um, in my head, I'm thinking, well, okay, there's going to be that flow of fans, you know, that are going to come into the gym because, you know, I had a, an, a, I established myself here. In, in yeah. Um, and so, you know, there'll be, we can utilize that, you know, to start our gym with. Well, that didn't happen, did it? So um, for the, like the first eight months, we were literally, you know, two people would come at the 6 a.m. boot camps, one or two, you know, in the other time slots. And so there were a lot of PB&J sandwiches being had because there were a lot of <laughs> checks going out, but not much coming in. And, oh, yeah. But thankfully, those two years of, you know, that, that last contract kind of gave us, you know, a little bit of a, a you know, time frame. To yeah, a cushion, right? Yeah. 
um, we stuck with it and we had the firefighters, a group of firefighters um, through a friend, the chief of one of those fire departments that live near the gym uh, was going to bring one of his, uh, his shifts in to come work out. So we were like, okay, well, we're going to kick their butts, you know, because not many of them were on board with it because, you know, there's these two chicks are going to work them out. Like, you mm-hmm. right kind of attitude. And we could tell that when they were walking in. So it's adaptability. This is where adaptability comes in. Well, the workout that we had set, but the attitudes that we felt coming through the door, we scrapped that, made something up on the fly. We kicked their butts and they kept coming back after that and probably, you know, gave us uh kept us in business purely from their own coming into the gym for the for the next year um Mm -hmm. at which time we then built it up and built it up so um like i said it's a process and uh, yeah we kept it going for eight years yeah i mean that's incredible it's really hard to do that and two things i pulled from your story is is one you you really thought that you had a lot figured out but when you realize that you didn't right the fans weren't just coming in you weren't too quick to be go okay well we got to figure it out right we got to learn on the fly we got to grow we got to adapt and i think that's a big thing that a lot of athletes should be thinking about is you got to start from not the bottom but you got to start from the beginning you can't skip steps to get to the next step of your you know whatever that next step is um yeah so I, i think that's one lesson i pulled from you and then the other one is like being able to pivot on the fly like if you're if you're able to do yeah. that in whatever business you're in that's that's the key i think we've all used that word too much over the last year but it's it's so important to be able to ana- like analyze the situation you're in and go well this isn't gonna work we gotta change it and you're trained to do that as an athlete because that's how you play that's how you play sports well this scheme isn't working or this play isn't working we're well, to change it up own, Ex- yeah exactly um it, it's it's so true though like just being able to adapt and change and um read the room um make the changes but it's like coaching you know getting the best out of every individual on your team is about uh, you can't you can't coach every single person the same um because everyone has a different personality so you've got to learn what you know you can say and how far you can push somebody else needs that to get the best out of them so um and the sports fitness industry was obviously i mean i'd played 20 years as a professional athlete so yeah. um thinking about what i wanted to get into after you know my playing days well fitness was kind of like a natural fit um to kind of like go straight into so yeah and learning the business side of things um was really interesting as well there's so much that has to you know you have to kind of like get into the nitty gritty of just down to the fact that you have to have certain signs up around the gym. Um, you know, there's just so much and we just kind of learned along the way. But like I said, in hindsight, um, if I had taken as much time into kind of preparing for this, as I'd said from the start, then just kind of like hammering it in in the last year, it would have been a, a much smoother transition. So, and a less, they're stressful as well. Uh, <laughs> fun at the same time. So, you know, yeah, it all kind of worked out in the end. <laughs> right. No, no regrets. Just, you know, again, it's, we all learn, you know, after the fact, we learn all the things, you know, that's the process of failure is you're like, Oh, well now I know I won't do that in the future. So it's, it's a learning opportunity, but yeah. And I know we're coming close to the time here, but I just have a couple more questions for you. Um, one that we talk okay. about with a lot of the athletes. Okay, I'm fine. <laughs> Good. You've got wine. You're good. <laughs> um, but I was going to say, obviously, we talk a lot about using your platform as an athlete here and how much power you have that you can use to go into whatever career you want and to advocate for whatever you want. And obviously, um, the league you played for, the WNBA, has been the leader of you know activism using your platform. Um, so what is it like watching now these these players kind of commit and I mean, elect a senator, number one, but just, you know, all of the activism they've been doing over the years. And what what should athletes, maybe they're not in the WNBA, maybe they're just, you know, maybe they're in college, maybe they're younger athletes that are trying to use that platform. What advice do you have for them about, you know, just being able to start speaking out or using that athlete platform for good, whatever cause that is? Um, well, first of all, um, just to acknowledge the WNBA again. I mean, like you said, um, 
you know, the one, the one professional team that really stood out and set the tone, I think, from, from the start in terms of using their voice um, in a, a positive way and others followed suit, but um, extremely proud of what the current players uh, are doing in terms of just trying to ask for simple things that should be there for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. And I have a daughter, I mean, I have a son and a daughter. And so my daughter is mixed, uh, she's biracial. And so it's been huge for me to have role models for her. Yeah. To, you know, look up to in the sport that I play. Um, they know a lot about the WNBA because they've, you know, they're at the age where they can remember a lot of things and, and obviously still being involved with the Indiana Fever. They go down there and still meet the players and, um, and everything. So um, it's been huge for me for, to have them to show them um, and, and also my son as well. Um, he's very aware of social issues these days. Um, he might be only 10, but he's, he's very aware of, of the world and goings on right now. So, you know, it's important for me to be able to, speak to him about it and yeah. to use the female role models for him. Um, but WNBA has been amazing forefront of all the professional sports teams and, you know, they deserve Definitely. a lot of credit. Um, in terms of advice and that, you know, obviously now social media is such a huge thing and players or just you know, anyone in general can use it um, in a very powerful way, but it also can be, negative as well, depending on how you use it. So, I mean, the advice I give mostly is just um, make sure you do your homework, you know, get the facts, um, you know, kind of get the, both sides and also have some points where, you know, um, what do you think, you know, solutions, have some solutions. Don't just, you know, be like rah, 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 but have some solutions maybe of your own that you can also, you know, bring into the conversation as well. Mm. Um, it's been an interesting phase because obviously uh, my wife Lindsay is a police officer. So right. we, there's, I see things from a few different sides yeah. um, and it's been a, a balancing act as well, just for me to, you know, make sure I'm, I'm also supporting, you know, things that she's doing, but I'm also seeing and understanding and, Yes, there are a lot of issues that need yeah. to be corrected from within the, the, you know, let's just use the police force as an example. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm very much, uh, you know, with, with what a lot of the players, um, you know, have been saying and, um, and asking for. And so, you know, it's just more about just educate. And I think that's one of the highlights of the WNBA players and the platforms. And, you know, they are so educated yeah. on, on the subjects that they're, you know, the social issues. And um, so I think that has to be commended as well. And, you know, you know, instead of maybe also, I think one other thing is like, just don't try and spread yourself, over, you know, everywhere. Like yeah. just, you know, pick a, initially I would say just, you know, pick a couple of um, issues that are really close to home for you. Um, and then, you know, channel, channel your energies there. And then as you get more comfortable with, you know, being an, an activist, I guess, and having your face out there and using your platform and stuff, then you can kind of like spread your wings a little bit more. But, you know, when you're starting out, um, yeah, just kind of like narrow it down to what you want to focus on, get all the information and, and kind of go from there. And then you can just broaden your horizons once you've kind of like established, you know, yourself and become very comfortable with uh, being a face. Yeah, I mean, that's perfect advice. I think just to start small, don't try and do too much at once. But I think the big piece is the education. Like you said, I think the WNBA players have done a really good job of making mm -hmm. sure that they know what they're asking for, that they know what the issues are, and yeah. they have a clear platform. So it's, it's there's, you know, if you, if you are confused, they have somewhere to send you to say, here's what we're asking for. And here's yeah. why, right? It's, there's, there's no mixed mis messages. For sure. I mean, it's really inspiring and empowering. And, you know, I think the difference now is all the the teams, obviously, you know, there's been ownership change um, with one of the teams just recently, so which is very positive. But now all the teams are involved now with yep. backing their players. Um, I think when I was first, well, you know, earlier on in my playing days and that there wasn't, you know, it was kind of like, kind of, you know, just, keep a little quieter about things and um, don't highlight 
you know, certain issues and, and obviously depend on where you're playing as well. Some places are a little bit more conservative. Um, so we didn't have that ability, I think, when I was to really kind of be as vocal. Um, yeah. And that's been great to see over time change and the teams get behind their players and show their support as well. So I think that's been um, one of the most significant things that I've seen too. Um, and so, yeah. You know. Yeah. No, it's great to see the opinion in the industry changing, but also just in the general public changing about athletes being able to use that platform. Yeah. Um, I think they've been doing it for a long time, right? But it hasn't been accepted. Um, it's kind of been negatively taken until probably the past few years. Um, and I think it's really great, like you said, to see the players being supported in what they're talking about instead of being like, Shh, no, 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 don't talk about that. Or, you know, not, not today, not here, that kind of thing. And they've kept the quality of play yes. going with it too. So it's yep. not, not taking away from um, their, you know, their training regimes and their performance out there on the court. I mean, the, the play in the bubble you know, last year was just phenomenal. Um, I think we didn't really want it to end. Um, <laughs> so, and obviously the TV coverage of all the games, uh, you know, really helped that as well. But I mean, the play was just fantastic to watch. And so, yeah, they can, they can do both. It's, yep. you know, it is doable and they shouldn't be tied down to, you know, just sticking to the basketball court. Totally. I think it's a great way to, to tie back to our earlier conversation of just getting that idea of what are you interested in? What are you passionate about outside of sports? Sometimes that, that kind of cause or community platform can be a great springboard to your next chapter as well. I mean, maybe you don't go into it full time as your next career, but gives you that taste of like life yeah. outside of your sport, right? That, oh, there's more than just basketball or soccer or whatever sport it is. So, yeah. And it might take you a couple of years to to find it, but, you know, at least have something in place um, from when you finish playing to step into, because um, I used to have conversations with Tamika Catch instead, and um, he played in the NBA um, for 11 years, and Harvey Catchings, his name was, and he would always tell me the story of some players who they took about, you know, say six months off or, you know, after playing, you know, just to go and just chill, whatever. But in that six month period, I mean, it is to go from a being a player to not, there is a big mental um, factor mm -hmm. that you have to deal with. Um, and so a lot of players were finding themselves falling into depression um, because you didn't have that day to day routine that you did as a player. I mean, you knew when you had to go to practice, you, you, you know, you were on a schedule. Now you're just chilling. I mean, and now you're also paying your own bills. You know, you're buying your own shoes and you know, everything was paid for except for yeah. fun activities and your petrol, you know, that's all you had to pay for. And so all of a sudden you're paying for your own insurance. You're paying for like, there are so many things that hit you so suddenly when you stop playing that you didn't take into account that you thought you were ready for, but you're not. So you, there are, um, certain things and, and the mental side of things and dealing mm -hmm. with not being amongst your teammates anymore and missing out on that um, camaraderie and you know you don't get the jokes anymore because you're not there with it, it like it, it does have an impact and it's different for everybody as to how much of an impact it has on them mentally so yeah yeah. With. yeah no I think that's a great point and you know I know um, we're going to wrap up here, but I think that's a really good point to close on is that like, it is a really individual process and it's really, it's, it's a really personal experience of what is next for each individual person as they leave sports. But also, like you said, how hard that transition is depends on person to person. And to your point earlier, like the earlier you can start to think about it, like day one, just start yeah. putting plans together. Even if you don't know what you want to do, just start investing in that time, right? To say, what am I interested in, right? Talk to those people. Um, I think it pays off a lot, but it's, it's very individual. And I appreciate you saying that it's not just getting a job or lining up a career. It's also about up here and making sure that you're ready and building that identity and building that mindset of like, I am more than just my sport. I'm not, if this ends, I'm going to be okay. Right. Yeah. I'm going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, hearing your name in the, you know, in the limelight and stuff like that, which some people may find it a little harder than, than others, but it's a reality that, uh, 
that's going to happen to everybody. So if we can help along the way now for athletes to prepare for it, um, yeah, it'll certainly help them. Yeah, definitely. And totally. So what's next for you? Um, you have a game coming up people should tune into. Do you have a project or initiative you're working on? Well, I've been doing some, you know, I've been working a little bit with the Horizon League. I um, called some of their semifinals um, a couple of months ago. I'm doing work with the, the high school, the Indiana High School here. I've got, I've got a boys' state final to um, commentate on Saturday. Um, and then hopefully we'll kind of pick up uh, where I left off uh, last year with the Indiana Fever. So mm-hmm. waiting for that to kind of uh, be announced with the schedule and everything and, and what local TV games and that will um, they'll get this year. So hoping for that as well. And then I would definitely love to transition um, from once WNBA is over into the college. Uh, you know, I've really, I never grew up with the college uh, basketball because, you know, I grew up in Australia. So, you know, I, I wasn't really following it when I was back home, but um, I'm like, you know, glued to it right now. Oh, and, it's been so fun to watch. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, it's been awesome. Um, that Baylor UConn game the other day was just the best basketball for the whole game. Like basically, oh yeah, the, the championship game, right? You know, in itself. Um, so I'd actually love to transition into commentating, you know, college uh, basketball too, and and just kind of like get a year round kind of commitment doing that. And it doesn't matter, boys. Boys, girls, men, women. I mean, it's, it, um, you know, basketball is basketball. Exactly. So that's, that's my, you know, ultimate goal is to kind of, uh, you know, head in that direction. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for so being here. Watching- I was, you know, big tans I was gonna say, who who can help Tony out here? Who's yeah. gonna connect her with some some college commentating? You know, <laughs> men's, women's, yeah. whatever, right? <laughs> just just throw it her way. You guys heard it here first. Connect her. Um, and thank you for for being here. How can people connect with you? Instagram, Twitter, like, what's the best way to get in touch with you well, if they want? Twitter is is my main handle. Um, so Bevelacqua forty one on Twitter. Um, I'm, you know, I love to kind of get on there and banter back and forth with the with people so you know don't be shy um so that's that is my main form of uh of social media i mean obviously i'm on instagram as tully 41 but um bevelacqua 41 on twitter that's the place to go find me cool well tully thank you so much for taking a long time out with us i appreciate all of your time i'm glad you brought some wine so we can answer some of these big questions here um and if if you want to hear more from Tolly. She's going to be speaking tomorrow at our summit. So make sure you go to our website, talkaboutsnext.com, if you want some more awesome insights um, from, from Tolly. And thank you for being here, Tolly. I really appreciate you sharing all this great stories and perspectives and advice for, for those watching and those that will watch later on. Well, Danielle, thank you again. I, I appreciate, you know, reaching out and stuff. I think this is a really, really important topic that um, needs to get highlighted because, like you said, um, mental depression can you know we don't we want to limit that um yeah. after a, a player's career has ended so yeah let's get on it love it well thanks again for being here and thanks everybody for tuning in i love that we had the tolly fan squad thanks, here today so <laughs> awesome well thanks tolly we'll see you tomorrow bye. and thanks everybody for tuning in bye bye